And if you compare these two charts, this is, um, this is the national debt and this is the money supply. You can see they're essentially the same thing. In fact, the federal debt basically is our money supply. The reason is, since all money comes from loans, and private loans eventually get paid back, but the federal debt never gets paid back. So any increase in the money supply comes from an increase in the federal debt. Um, this, is, this is how it's done. The uh, government prints pink pieces of paper called bonds, and it, it trades them with the Federal Reserve for green pieces of paper called Federal Reserve notes. Now we, the taxpayers, are on the hook for the face amount of the bonds, in this case $100, but the Federal Reserve gets, the, gets, the, uh, gets their green pieces of paper for the cost of printing them, or I think it's up to about six cents a bill now. So they're getting what's called the seniorage, or the benefit of creating this money, not the government. So that raises the natural question, why doesn't the government just print the green pieces of paper and skip, skip the print? pink piece of paper. Either way, it's inflationary. Either way, you're, you're adding to the money supply and you're adding to the... Why not skip the debt and just, just put it out there into the money supply? The answer is that at one time we did. We, in fact, for the first hundred years of our existence as a... Before we were actually a nation, um, the American colonists came up with this brilliant idea where they, they didn't have money, they didn't have gold, and the governor of Massachusetts um, had to fight a war, and he didn't have any money to fight it with. So, so he decided to just issue these little paper receipts, and he paid the soldiers and all the people that he owed money to. And he said, you know, go. This is legal tender. Go spend it in the community, and that became their money supply, and it worked really well. Um, it worked better for some colonies than others because it was all experimental, and they didn't, you know, they just started out with this idea. So in the northern colonies, they tended to just issue money and issue money. They were supposed to tax the people to bring it back to avoid inflation, but they, they weren't very good about the taxes. And so mostly they were just issuing money and they hyperinflated the money supply. But in Pennsylvania, they had the ideal system where instead of just printing and spending, printing and spending, they lent most of the money. They had a bank. Uh, the Pennsylvania provincial government owned its own bank and it lent money to the farmers at 8% interest. I mean, sorry, at 5% interest. And the British bankers were lending at 8% interest, so this was a good deal for the farmers. And the money went back to the provincial government, so it was a completely closed system. And then to avoid this usury problem where, where you have, you always are taking back more money than you put out, they put out some money they printed some extra money for their expenses, roads, bridges, whatever it was they, they needed uh, in the government. So, for example, if you started with $105, you could um, lend $100 at 5% interest, then spend an additional $5 into the community, then you'd have $105 circulating in the community. That $105 would all come back um, to the government as principal and interest, and then you could lend the very same $100 again to someone else, spend the same $5 into the community, and 105 would come back. So you would never, you would never have to inflate your money supply, but you still could have a, an interest system. It, it works as long as the interest is going back to the government, and as long as the government is, also has the power to issue money, and it issues some extra on the side. Benjamin Franklin was called the father of paper money. He was really excited about this whole system. He said it was due to this paper money that the colonies were thriving when um, in England they were suffering the um, Industrial Re Revolution, the poverty conditions of the Industrial Revolution. He said um, there are three great friends, an old wife, an old dog, and ready money. That was in uh, Poor Richard's Almanac. Many that understand business very well but have not a stock sufficient of their own will be encouraged to borrow money to trade with when they have it at a moderate interest. That's the whole idea of credit. That, that is actually what has made our country great for 300 years, the ability to get credit. You hear about these microloans that are so exciting to people in third world countries. They're at up to like 20% interest for if you get a microloan for a house, which is like really high. But it's so exciting to these um, little entrepreneurs to get a $50 loan because without that, they have nothing. They have no way, they have no collateral, nothing that they can put up to get started with. 
Well, in our country, we've been blessed with this system. Even though the banking system is ultimately flawed and has now reached the end of the line, it has worked up to this point to give us ready credit, and that's what's um, funded all the development that we've experienced. Um, Franklin also said that because of their ready paper money, by 1750, there was abundance in the colonies and peace was reigning on every border. It was difficult and even impossible to find a happier and more prosperous nation on all the surface of the globe. Comfort was prevailing in every home. The people in general kept the highest moral standards and education was wide, widely spread. It worked until King George got wind of it in the 1750s. Actually, it was the British merchants who complained because they were getting paid in this paper money that from the New England colonies was devaluing. And so they complained to the king. And, and, uh, and so the king said, we couldn't issue our own money. And that caused a, a, a depression in the colonies because then all they could do was use gold and they had to pay taxes to England in gold and they didn't have gold. So that meant they had to borrow from the British bankers. So that put us in debt to England. And uh, we naturally rebelled against that. According to Benjamin Franklin, uh, that was the real reason for the Revolutionary War, the fact that they took away our money. The colonies would gladly have borne the little tea tax and other matters had it not been the poverty caused by the bad influence of the English bankers on the parliament, which has caused in the colonies hatred of England and the Revolutionary War. Um, an English an historian named John Twells uh, reinforced that idea. He said, issuing their own scrip was the monetary system under which America's colonies flourished to such an extent that Edmund Burke, Burke was able to write about them. Nothing in the history of the world resembles their progress. It was a sound and beneficial system, and its effects led to the happiness of the people. In a bad hour, the British Parliament took away from America its representative money, forbade any further issue of bills of credit, these bills ceasing to be legal tender, and ordered that all taxes should be paid in coins. Consider now the consequences. The restriction of the medium of exchange paralyzed all the industrial energies of the people. Ruin took place in these once flourishing colonies, most rigorous despair distress visited every family and every business, discontent became desperation and reached a point, to use the words of Dr. Johnson, when human nature rises up and asserts its rights. So that meant war, but the problem was we didn't have any money to conduct a war. So the amazing thing was, it was a, a, a marvel around the world that we managed to win a war and we didn't have any money. What we funded it with was this paper script. The problem was, of course, as everyone knows, that the Continental devalued so much by the end of the war that it was virtually worthless, so everybody got disillusioned with it. And that everybody blamed the government for hyperinflating the money supply, but that is not actually what happened. The reason it devalued was that it was because it was paper, but it, paper at that time was easily counterfeited. So what happened was that the British, as a matter of war policy, counterfeited the Continentals and they printed so many, they printed more than that than the Continental Congress printed. So that was one thing that happened to it. They, they had ships outside the harbor in New York that were madly printing money and they advertised that anybody could have it for, for, you know, for any amount of money. So they wanted to get it out in the circulation to devalue our money. Besides that, uh, the Continental had to compete with um, the state's um, a script which which had more had more credibility because they were backed by taxes and police and so forth. This was this was the script of a of an army that might not even win. So, it, given the choice, you would always take gold or you would take the the state script. So that meant it's just like today with third world countries, how their currency gets devalued relative to the, to the dollar. You'd rather take the stronger currency so then the weaker one that trades for less and less. And then what finally killed it was the speculators. They went around and they said, that money's not going to be worth anything after the war. And they bought it up for pennies on the dollars, on the dollar from the soldiers and um, the people who had earned it.